Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. Um, so we've talked so far about glycolysis and uh, the 10 steps in that pathway um, and some of the feeder pathways so that we can eat other things besides just glucose and get energy from them. And some of the phase of pyruvate. We'll talk more about uh, phase of pyruvate and other cell types under other conditions in, in, the, next, um, in the next lectures. Um, but for today, we want to pause a little bit and talk about this idea about regulation. Okay, we mentioned a little bit the idea of, you know, you want to break down glucose and other sugars, other molecules, if you want energy, but you don't want to be breaking them down all the time. You want to sometimes store them or use your glucose for something else. And we talked about a little bit also with the idea of the pentose phosphate pathway that glucose could also go down that pathway, but we don't necessarily want to do that either because sometimes we have plenty of five carbon sugars and plenty of NADPH, and, and so maybe we do want to send some down, down glycolysis, or maybe we use the glucose for something else. And other times we do need NADPH, or we do need a lot of ribose if we're making DNA or RNA or certain co coenzymes, things like that. So then we do want to turn up the activity of the pentose phosphate pathway. So today, we're going to um, a pause between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. We're going to talk a little bit about metabolic re regulation in general. And we'll also, in the, sort of the second half, we'll talk also about um, uh, glycogen, uh, breaking it down, and then also how, how we make that. Because um, that also has to be regulated. That's another place where glucose goes and where we can um, um, get glucose when we need it. But I, I feel like I'm like really loud today. <laughs> okay, okay, so let's, let's think a little bit first about metabolic pathways in general, right? We, we have like this glycolysis, which is actually sort of in, in, in dark blue, going right here, sort of, you know, nice central pathway. Notice a lot of other things are connecting to that in this map. Uh, down here is the citric acid cycle, nice and round. Um, the cycle. Okay, so um, we have all these different pathways in addition to glycolysis in, in this sort of map here. Um, these different pathways, and, and you can see there's some labels here. Some are for metabolizing amino acids, maybe making them or breaking them down or using them for something. Also, we have lipids over here, um, uh, other types of energy metabolism, um, uh, breaking things down xenobiotics, so breaking things down that maybe our body doesn't need, that maybe come from food or other places. Um, so we have all these different pathways. And um, a lot of them have dedicated purposes. Okay? They evolve to do something, something that benefits the organism in some way. Uh, so some of these we're going to extract energy from food, or for those of us who are plants, not me, but you know, other people <laughs> who are plants, no. Okay, so plants out there and certain other um, organisms like cyanobacteria can get energy from uh, sunlight. Um, some of our pathways are for storage of fuels, and we'll talk about uh, glycogen synthesis and breakdown today. Uh, of course, there are other ways of storing food, like as, as, or fuel, like as, as fat and everything. Um, we have some pathways that are dedicated for synthesis of important building blocks. Okay, again, things like ribose 5 phosphate we use for a lot of things, right? Um, uh, there might be import, uh, making the different amino acids, right? We need all these different amino acids. Some we can get from food, some we uh, make from other things that we take in. And we also need to be, be able to get rid of waste products, okay, breakdown products. Um, also things like carbon dioxide, we need to get rid of that, right? Okay, um, and this is, uh, I was kind of pointing out, this is, we can represent these as a map, and, and if you think of each of these as a different enzyme, the little, the little dots, okay, or points, the nodes um, connected by the lines or vectors, um, you can see they're kind of all um, connected here, but we can, we can draw them out. Um, this, is, this is actually done quite a bit as we're trying to figure out how some of these new organisms you know, in, in our, that are being found in our gut or in the seawater and stuff like that. How, how do they work? What do they have in there? What are these, some of these new metabolic pathways that we might be able to use for things? Or if it's a pathogen, are there metabolic pathways that the pathogen needs? 
but we want to knock it out, kill the pathogen and cure a disease or whatever. So we can think about all the different metabolism in an organism, draw it out as a map, figure out where do different metabolize different foods or different products from reactants go. Um, we can follow them through some of these different pathways. Like I said, things like pyruvate and everything might have different, different fates under different conditions, even within the same organism in some cases. Um, we often want to figure out what are the enzymes that are needed for this pathway. And sometimes people can do things like even draw out part of a pathway and go like, oh, we know we're missing an enzyme right here. So what in this genome could possibly catalyze the reaction? Um, but we also want to think about how are these different pathways regulated? You know, if we do something, we affect one pathway, what's going to happen to the cell? Um, if we, for example, eat a certain type of food, what's going to happen overall, or take a certain type of medication or something? And we also want to identify sources of metabolic diseases. So these are things like we all have some variation in our genomes, and some of that variation um, uh, can affect enzymes that um, um, we need, um, and they might make them um, less active. Okay, so in some cases we'll actually have some sort of uh, um, disease phenotype if certain enzymes aren't working optimally or if we're completely missing a particular enzyme. So if we can kind of draw out what's going on and figure out what's going on uh, with different metabolites and, and maybe what's missing or what's um, not working so well, we might be able to figure out what enzyme is affected in that particular disease. And sometimes we can um, find some sort of solution. In some cases we don't necessarily fix that enzyme, but maybe we can work around it avoid a certain type of food or use a different um, uh, uh, food in its place, for example. Uh, so we, in some cases, even if we can't replace a damaged enzyme, we can come up with some sort of treatment for the disease. Okay. Okay. So let's think about this idea of regulation. We have all these different pathways. They're all kind of Notice how they inter interconnect, they're crossing each other, they, some of them will share the same little dot, the same little enzyme there. Lots of things are going on all the time in all our different cells, lots and lots of things. But we need to keep everything kind of balanced, okay, that homeostasis, you've probably heard of in other classes earlier on. We need to keep everything balanced, we need to make enough products that we need, we need to get rid of waste products before they build up too high, you know, we need a lot of things. And sometimes we need to modify things very quickly, okay? So you're running for the bus, okay? Or you're running away from a tiger, okay? Here in Chicago is more often the bus, okay? So, um, <laughs> okay, so you need to be able to turn up glycolysis and energy producing pathways really fast. Okay, you can't go like, oh, there's the bus 10 minutes later. Oh, now I've got some energy to run after it. Okay, you need to turn that on now. Okay, increase the capacity of glycolysis during the action and you move, okay. Um, but when you're done, hopefully you caught the bus, okay. Maybe you didn't, but in either case, you want to slow down glycolysis. You don't want to be like, oh, I caught the bus, but now I'm just going to burn up all the rest of my glucose and keel over dead. Um, you want to stop burning uh, glucose at that high level when you're done with the action, okay? Um, and then, after you're done, sometimes you need to go around and, and adjust things. So we talk, when we talked about that idea of, oh, we can make lactate when we're running really fast, we can temporarily make lactate, get our NAD back to keep glycolysis going. We talked about that in the, the last lecture. Um, but now you're done running, hopefully you caught the bus, hopefully the tiger didn't eat you. And now we need to maybe get rid of that lactose, lactate, sorry. Um, send it in the bloodstream to the liver and maybe turn on gluconeogenesis, okay? Get rid of some of the waste products, okay? Maybe 
readjust things in the body so that we have um, you know, some, some more um, glycogen ready for the next um, time we have to run or something. Okay, so it's not just turning up something. We need to turn up, we need to turn down, we need to bring back into balance everything in the cell and in the organism. So how do we turn up and down these different pathways? Well, there's a lot of different ways. Some enzymes will be affected by a few of these. Some will be affected maybe even possibly by all of them. Okay. Um, concentration of reactant. If you have no glucose, you know, and none of these other molecules that can, can be used, you don't have any glucose or mannose or fructose or any of those that we talked about, then you don't have any glycolysis. Okay. You need some substrate. So the amount of substrate or the amount of reactant is important. Okay. And some of the enzymes are made and they sit around until there's enough reactant, until there's some reactant. Okay. You have them in, in preparation. Okay. Um, so you just don't get product until you actually have substrate around. Okay. I hear some talking because some, uh, let's, um, let's, uh, uh, try and hold our conversation so that, um, your, um, neighbors over here can, um, can actually hear and so it can be recorded for anyone listening at home. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Level of activity of the catalyst. Okay. We're talking about biochemistry here. So our catalysts are the enzymes. Okay. So, um, different cell types or different times in the cell. You might have just different amounts of the enzyme, okay? Different amounts of different proteins. Intrinsic activity of the enzyme. That just means that certain enzymes go really fast, make lots and lots of product really fast, and some are much slower. They don't need to make a lot of product. You only need maybe one of a certain type of molecule every hour. Okay, another type of molecule, maybe you need a thousand every minute or something. So, you know, some enzymes are much faster than others. There can also be concentrations of effectors. So this is a general term, allosteric regulators. Different things can bind to enzymes and uh, these are um, generally outside of the active site, but they bind somewhere and adjust the enzyme to make it likely to go faster or not so fast when it, when it, um, uh, 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 um, when, when there's substrate around, so it'll bind it and make product faster. Competing substrates, okay? So enzymes, yes, they're very, 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 very specific, but they sometimes can use different substrates, okay? We talked about one last time, hexakinase. That will work on glucose, fructose, mannose, sometimes other six carbon sugars, or other hexoses. Okay. Um, and also things like pH or ionic environment. Think again, we talked about, you know, pH and how you can protonate and deprotonate uh, molecules and amino acids and everything. And then we think about like active sites and enzymes and folded proteins and everything. There's a lot of places in a protein where a functional group might be protonated or deprotonated. And whether something's protonated or deprotonated can affect whether something can bind in the active site, whether some of those catalytic amino acids can do whatever it is they do, whether it is get phosphorylated or whether it is do a nucleophilic attack or whatever it is, that can depend a lot on whether key active site amino acids are protonated or deprotonated. You can also just have um, effects of pH on the overall protein as well, um, on the surface, how um, they interact with each other, with other proteins, um, and uh, other things. Some of them aren't activated. Some enzymes aren't really activated until they're in the right sort of environment. So sometimes when you um, digest your food, some of the um, enzymes um, only really get activated when they're more acidic environment, like in your gut. Okay, and also temperature. Temperature is really important. Um, so we're made, right? We evolved to have our cells at a certain range of temperatures. You get too hot, doesn't work too well. You get too cold, doesn't work too well. Okay, and in fact, if you 
take proteins and heat them up too high, they'll just unfold. Um, and actually, if you um, uh, get them too cold, sometimes they're, they'll unfold too. So we are mesophils, okay, we're moderate temperature. There are other species that actually live in different temperatures, like in um, little um, uh, uh, bubbling pools near volcanoes, for example, or deep sea vents, where it's super hot, there's still living bacteria in those pools. We would die very quickly if we fell in one of those pools by the volcanoes. But they're perfectly happy, they survive, um, they're fine. And also, like up in the Arctic, uh, uh, you know, if we laid out there in the snow for very long, we'd be dead. But there are bacteria that live in the snow. They're perfectly fine. Okay, so temperature is going to affect the rates. Different organisms need different temperatures. There are different um, enzymes need different temperatures. Okay, so let's talk about some types of regulation, and then we'll talk about sort of regulation in general, and then we'll go through, um, uh, like I said, uh, we're going to talk about glycogen, uh, sort of the second half of the lecture. Okay, so we've talked a number of times about this idea of phosphorylation. Okay, um, way back when we were talking about amino acids, serine, threonine, and tyrosine are, are three of the amino acids that are um, phosphorylated. These are the ones that are, I would say, most commonly phosphorylated in terms of regulation. Many, 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 many proteins have regulation by phosphorylation of serine, threonine, or tyrosine. The phosphorylation is catalyzed by a protein kinase. Again, kinase, think use of ATP, leaving behind ADP, and a phosphoryl group being transferred to something. In this case, it's the hydroxyl group on serine, threonine, or tyrosine. Serine, threonine, or tyrosine. Um, and then, um, in some cases, the phosphoryl group will just uh, uh, come off again, okay? Um, in some particular enzymes, you get hydrolysis of that phosphoryl group spontaneously. But in many other cases, you do have phosphoprotein phosphatases, hydrolysis, leaving behind inorganic phosphate and bringing you back to the unphosphorylated protein. So, does phosphorylation activate? the enzyme or deactivate it? It depends. So this is one of the things I say like, I don't know. Sometimes it activates. Certain enzymes will be activated by the activity of a specific protein kinase. Other enzymes will be deactivated, maybe even by that same protein kinase, maybe by different ones. The very same protein might have different sites multiple sites of phosphorylation and a certain pattern of sites of phosphorylated and unphosphorylated determines whether that enzyme is turned on or off. And this is a way of actually bringing in regulation of a particular protein by many different pathways. For example, there are some things that our cells do that are rather complicated, like divide. If a cell divides, it needs more proteins, more lipids, more sugars, more everything, right? So if you don't have enough of something, like energy or enough proteins or whatever, the cell doesn't want to start dividing because it would get stuck halfway and probably die. Okay, so you might have lots of different kinases joining in the regulation, so bringing information from different pathways and different processes to one or a few proteins that then would be the sort of the master regulators that would say, okay, we've got everything we need, let's go ahead and divide. Or it might say, whoa, we're missing something, we don't have enough energy, we, didn't, we, don't, we haven't uh, uh, properly copied our DNA yet or something, and, um, and, and hold off until we're ready, okay? So phosphorylation, again, comes up so many places in, um, in uh, biochemistry. 
Um, here's, here's another um, example with a, a bit of a picture here. So you can also regulate an enzyme by having different things bind to it. Okay, so, so here we have one polypeptide chain that's a, the blue blob, okay, the blue protein here, um, catalytic subunit. This is the one that's actually going to do something. It's going to actually take some substrate and make some product. Great, okay? Um, but it can be inhibited by a small molecule, okay? Maybe it's something, maybe it's a competitive inhibitor that looks something like the substrate. It might have a whole other polypeptide chain. Here's the green blob over here. And sometimes, some proteins are actually made in such a way that the, you have a, a um, catalytic subunit and a regulatory subunit. Sometimes they hang out together most of the time. Other, in other cases, they, they kind of come together as, as um, things change in the cell. Sometimes they're together, sometimes they're not. Um, so it, it might need the help of this regulatory partner to be active, or it might be the opposite. It might be that the regulatory subunit actually slows down at this activity. Um, you can also have other proteins involved. This one we call a scaffold, and this is basically giving a place to bring together in an organized fashion the catalytic subunit and the regulatory subunit. And sometimes scaffolds combine um, more than two proteins too, to bring together like a whole um, um, group of proteins involved in a, in a process or a pathway. Okay, so you might have um, uh, other proteins involved, you might have small molecules involved, you might have all of them involved. You might have a whole complex different things coming together. And when, when we talk about like small molecule, like what's going on there, well one type of a small molecule um, that can be involved, again we mentioned a couple examples if you look back in the pathways we talked about, glycolysis and pentose phosphate pathway for example. Um, one way is feedback inhibition. So here we have an example, here's an amino acid threonine and it's catalyzed by an enzyme, we'll call it enzyme 1, to product B, and that gets converted to C, and then D, and then E, and then F. Eventually we get this other amino acid isoleucine. Okay, so this is a product of the pathway, just like ATP is a product of glycolysis, or NADPH is a product of pentose phosphate pathway. And so in feedback inhibition, one of these products, in this case, in this picture, isoleucine, comes back and inhibits enzyme 1 in this pathway. Okay, so it's some product of the pathway is inhibiting an earlier step. And so that's what we say feedback, because it's coming back to the beginning to inhibit something. Notice here we're inhibiting enzyme 1. Okay, we're not inhibiting enzyme whatever this is between E and F. Okay? Hmm, why not? Seems like a perfectly good place, right? You inhibit there, you inhibit there, whatever. Well, think about it. If we inhibit between A and B, we get A, which is threonine, which is an amino acid we can use to make proteins, or maybe we can break it down for other things. We can, we can do various things with a threonine, okay? If we're way down here between E and F, and now we hit the brakes, okay, we stop, inhibit here, um, what we end up with is a bunch of E. E might not be that useful to the cell. In fact, in some cases, you build up a whole bunch of some of these, some intermediate, and it's not, you know, it might actually be kind of bad for the cell. So you might want to come up here and inhibit enzyme 1 because you have a step where you're still you know, have some sort of substrate that's useful for other things. So basically, you're, you can send threonine down other pathways. It's not committed to any particular pathway. So we come all the way back here and inhibit here. So that's just like the idea of ATP, a sign that our cell has lots of energy, inhibits the committed step of glycolysis. Okay, and glycolysis is not the first step. It's not hexokinase. Right, because the product of hexokinase, glucose 6 it can be used in many, many other ways in the cell, but in glycolysis, we inhibit the third step, which is the committed step, 
for glycolysis. Okay, so, um, and then for um, Pendose phosphate pathway, NADPH is one of the products of that pathway. And again, that product, if there's plenty of it in the cell, it will come back and bind to one of the earlier enzymes, slow down that pathway, which again gives us glucose or glucose 6-phosphate that can be used for other things. Okay, so you're going to come back, you're going to um, inhibit an enzyme in a place in the pathway where hopefully the, the substrate before that can be used for other things. Okay, so those are some of the examples um, of how we can regulate enzymes. And this, this figure, I think, is a really nice summary showing you that there's many, many levels. Okay, so here's, here's our enzyme over here, the blue oval, our enzyme. We talked about the idea that we can phosphorylate it. So going straight up here where there's this number nine up here and the little P in the circle, okay? So we have kinase and phosphatase. You can um, phosphorylate it, dephosphorylate it, okay? Turn it on or off. Um, combination with regulatory protein, we had that nice diagram. Or with, um, where's our inhibitor? Oh, they don't show the inhibitor on here, okay. But there's a, a, a um, allosteric effector, so a, a ligand um, uh, somewhere else in the actosite. Or, or just, you know, again, having enough of the substrate around for the reaction to go. All these things can affect how fast the enzyme is going to go. We can also think about just how much enzyme is there, okay? So you have enzyme in your cells. You can go from, take substrate, make product. But um, one way to regulate that, if you don't need so much product anymore, is get rid of the enzyme so you can break it down. So there are ways of doing things like adding a little protein called ubiquitin. Ubiquitinylation of your enzyme can cause it to go to the proteasome, which is this cool machine in your, like a cylinder that grinds up, chews up, breaks down polypeptide chains. So you can send it to the cell's trash receptacle, basically, and break it down. Um, you can also send it somewhere else, okay? And, and this can be, maybe if you want to slow down the activity, this is also a way of, of, of making a bunch of enzyme and maybe hanging on to it until it's needed. Um, it's sequestered in, for example, a subcellular organelle, okay? Uh, put it somewhere, store it until it's needed, or um, sometimes it's, it's not just a method, method of like not using it, but again, remember that we have all these different places in our cells, and we have all these different cell types and everything, so sometimes we want to regulate things by having certain pathways occurring in certain organelles. Okay, so the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, you're going to add uh, carbohydrate chains to proteins, for example. Okay, in um, the um, chloroplast, in plants, you'll have photosynthesis going on. Okay, so you want to gather all the important proteins and enzymes for that, all in one place, put it in a nice organized fashion so it'll work. Okay, so you can have regulation holding things until they're needed in a particular place or just organizing them in a particular place. And sometimes you want to have that sort of organized so that you have this pathway separate from another pathway. Maybe you're building something here, but over here you're breaking something down. Okay, so um, these all are things that happen to enzymes. But there's this whole other part of here on the left is just all the different things that can affect how much of that enzyme you're even making in the first place. So um, our enzymes, I think you know the central dogma, we have our little DNA blueprint and our chromosomes and that gets read to make mRNA, which you'll hear how that's done later, but I think maybe you know the, some of the basics um, from earlier biology classes. So you get some RNA, and then that's read by these blobs called the ribosomes, okay, um, to make your enzyme. So there's a bunch of steps here between DNA and enzyme. So you have the DNA, 
that's read to make the mRNA, while there's things like, which mRNAs should I make? How much mRNAs should I make? Should I make the RNA hold on to it, maybe sequester it, until such time that I want to read it, okay? Um, once I have some RNA, and there's a whole bunch of, remember this different mRNAs for all the different types of proteins in your cell, maybe some of these I want to have around a long time because I want to make a lot of proteins, a lot of copies of the polypeptide chain from that one set of instructions. But in other cases, maybe I just want to make a little bit of that protein and then break down that RNA. Okay, get rid of it. I made what I need, I'm done. Break down the mRNA. Okay, so this mRNA, different rates of degradation for different mRNAs. And then also just the translation, the, the, the ribosome coming to the RNA. Again, big area of regulation. Uh, how often should it bind and uh, read it? Okay, now we can, we can even come out here a little farther and say uh, when we talk about uh, which, um, which places on the DNA, which genes are we going to express and make mRNA and everything, we have these proteins called transcription factors that will come and bind to different places in the DNA. And there can be huge, extensive, many, many, many pathways just regulating when those transcription factors actually bind to DNA. Some actually are out here in the cytosol and then only go into the nucleus at certain times, so they only bind the DNA at certain times uh, when they're uh, interacting with other things. And some of that is regulated by receptors. This shows one sitting in the membrane. There are some that are um, more cytosolic or nuclear, but, uh, and these can be turned on or off by extracellular signals, th signals. These can be small molecules or sometimes proteins, um, we might refer to them as hormones in some cases. And these can trigger a receptor that triggers a whole pathway that affects one or maybe many transcription factors that come in here and turn on one gene, get the cell to read that particular piece of DNA, or maybe DNA in a whole bunch of different places. Um, a lot of times when you have a process going on in the cell, you have a whole bunch of different proteins involved. So. Uh, sometimes you, you send a signal to the cell up here, receptor, turn on transcription factor, and it binds to very specific places, but multiple places in the genome to turn on all the genes needed for a particular pathway. Okay, okay I hear some talking again. Sorry, could we, could we hold off the conversation until um, we're done today? Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's many, many, many places where there's regulation. Um, what's most important for a particular protein or pathway or whatever can vary quite a bit. It might be certain things are mainly regulated by how long their mRNA is around. Other things might be very much regulated by, you know, three, four, five different kinases and phosphatases or something. So different proteins will be regulated by different things. And of course, you could have a combination of these different things that all come together. So we talked about glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. And this is a great example of regulation. When we have glycolysis, okay, we're going to take our glucose, and break it down, and in the process, get some energy. ATP, and for organisms like us, breathing oxygen, the NADH can later be used to make more ATP as well. Um, so we can take glucose, uh, make pyruvate, and get some ATP. We can also take pyruvate, we and many other organisms, and go in the other direction and make glucose. But in order to do that, we need to invest some ATP, but we don't get it back up here. Remember these steps up here, these, these curves, this fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, this glucose 6-phosphatase. We don't get ATP back at the end of gluconeogenesis. We just invest ATP um, down, in, down in these areas, okay? So you don't want to have 
a lot of cases, a lot, a lot of, you don't want to have this happening in a lot of places where you're like, burning up glucose, you get a little bit of ATP, but then you like invest it all back to just make the glucose again. Okay, you don't want that going on all the time. You might want some glycolysis, some gluconeogenesis. You don't want it all going all the time. If, if you do that, you, if you have it all going on and all the time, you're going to be making some ATP, but you're actually going to be burning up even more. You're just going to lose up, lose so much energy that um, the cell wouldn't survive. So this is what's called a futile cycle. You're, you're breaking down glucose, getting a little energy, but then you're just using it all. You're not making any progress. Okay? So we need to regulate glycolysis and regulate gluconeogenesis. And here's, here's one of the places, phosphofructokinase 1. We talked about that. Okay, first committed step in glycolysis. This is a place, this is a place. Either you go through glycolysis or you use your glucose for something else. So let's look at a little experiment here. We can follow the activity of the enzyme under different concentrations of the substrate. You get a little bit of substrate over here on the left, you get a little bit of activity, a little bit of product. Okay, um, you add more and more and more, well, enzyme rate goes up, you get more and more product, more and more product. At some point, it flattens out because you only have so much enzyme. Okay, so you're adding more and more fructose, 6-phosphate, you're only going to get so much product because you only have so much enzyme around. Okay, now let's add a whole bunch of ATP. This is a sign that our cell has plenty of energy. Okay, let's see what happens. Now, so this is the red, the red curve. Down here at the bottom, well, we've got some fructose 6-phosphate around. We're not getting a whole lot of product. The enzyme's not working very fast, okay? If we add more and more and more and more fructose 6-phosphate, okay, well, now we get a little more activity up here. Okay, eventually, if we have enough substrate around, we have a lot of this, yeah, maybe we'll get pretty, pretty high activity, okay? But you really need a lot more fructose 6-phosphate around when you have a lot of ATP. So we say that ATP is a negative regulator. ATP is affecting how quickly this enzyme acts, even though we have a bunch of substrate around. Okay, you can have a bunch of substrate around, but the enzyme isn't going to work very fast if you already have a lot of ATP in the cell. Okay, so again, you don't want to be burning up all your glucose if you have a lot of ATP already in the cell. So this is a, a mechanism that's evolved where the ATP actually binds to the enzyme in such a way that it's going to slow down the activity. And we have a little diagram here where we can say, okay, well, here's, here's that enzyme, phosphofructokinase 1, uh, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Here's our ATP. It's going to give us a little red X. It's going to say, slow down enzyme. Okay? Now, this enzyme is sensitive to other things as well. Okay? So ADP, you might have a lot of ADP around if you've used a bunch of your ATP, right? So what's the product of a kinase is often ADP. So if you've taken a lot of ATP, uh, use it to phosphorylate something, okay, and you have a lot of ADP around, that, that's a sign that maybe the cell needs more ATP. Maybe you need to make more ATP. So you get the little green triangle, it says, turn on the activity of phosphofructokinase 1. Okay. AMP is another molecule that's basically, uh, if you've removed two phosphoryl groups from ATP, you get AMP. So again, you get the little green triangle, or turn on, turn up the activity of phosphofructokinase 1. Now citrate, a little foreshadowing here. We're going to see citrate in the citric acid cycle. So this is a product we get later on in other energy producing pathways. If you have a lot of citrate around, that's another sign that the cell already has a lot of energy. So you get the little red X here. Little red X. Slow down phosphorfructokinase 1. Okay, so we can regulate glycolysis 
at this committed step by detecting the presence of ATP, saying the cell has a lot of energy, or citrate, another molecule that gives us a clue that the cell doesn't really need to burn up a lot of glucose and glycolysis, or we can actually turn it up if we have a need for energy, which is when we detect there's a bunch of ADP or AMP around. Okay. Now, that's glycolysis coming down this pathway. Okay, investing our ATP to make fructose one six phosphate, getting through the committed step, moving on to the rest of glycolysis. But the opposite direction would happen in um, gluconeogenesis. And this is one of those three places where you have a different enzyme going in the direction of gluconeogenesis. And this is fructose, fructose bisphosphatase 1, and you take fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, remove a phosphoryl group, and you lose it as inorganic phosphate, and then you get fructose 6-phosphate. Now this pathway of gluconeogenesis, you need to invest energy. You need to invest ATP and GTP. Okay, you need, if you're going to be doing a lot of it, you need a lot of energy. So if you have a sign like this AMP, if you have a lot of AMP around, that's a sign that your cell might not have a lot of energy. Maybe you don't want to be trying to do a lot of gluconeogenesis if your cell doesn't have a lot of energy. So this AMP can be sensed and slow down, little red X, slow down the activity of fructose bisphosphatase. So what we're doing here is signs of having a lot of energy regulating glycolysis, signs of not having much energy regulating glycolysis too, but also regulating that, that um, enzyme that's sort of the um, doing the opposite, different enzyme doing the opposite sort of step in gluconeogenesis. So we can regulate both pathways. We have these two different enzymes and they can sense things about the cell by binding to some of these small molecules. Okay. Now sometimes we also have things that aren't so directly just like, oh, here's ATP, here's AMP, here's ADP, signs of, yep, lots of ATP or not lots of ATP. There may be other pathways that feed in and regulate whether a particular pathway is turned up or turned down. And one of those is by um, uh, making um, this uh, other molecule, which is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Okay, so this is not the same molecule that we were talking about in, in, in glycolysis. Um, and uh, let's see, so this is made by another pathway um, triggered by a hormone. So one of these things that, you know, back in this figure, I said we can have things come in from outside the cell, send signals in here, and things can happen to the activity of our enzymes and everything. So that's an example um, uh, coming a little more directly this way, uh, regulation um, uh, of the uh, pathways. Okay, so you can make this molecule, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, and it's going to regulate both enzymes. It's going to turn up phosphofructokinase 1 and turn down fructose bisphosphatase 1. So here we have a molecule. The production is triggered by a hormone that is telling us something that's going on in the whole organism, and it, it's going to regulate in opposite ways these two different pathways. Okay, so, um, so we can have small molecules, we can have uh, uh, feedback inhibition, we can have other proteins and everything. Um, we also mentioned this, just this idea of gene expression. So, um, uh, and this gene expression is one of the things that regu that's regulated by the hormone insulin. 
Again, if, if, if you've heard of diabetes or whatever, diabetes is when someone doesn't have, the, isn't producing the right amounts of insulin at the right times, and so the cells aren't taking up and utilizing um, glucose properly, okay? So um, it does a number of things. It triggers a number of pathways. It binds to one of these cell surface receptors up here and triggers a number of pathways, um, including turning up and down, or I'm sorry, uh, adjusting the levels of expression of certain proteins. So um, here's uh, things like uh, some of the hexokinases in different cell types for um, glycolysis, phosphofructokinase, pyruvate kinase. So this is making, um, changing the amount of, of protein that's being made, and then some of the other pathways as well. So you can see insulin actually has, as a hormone has an effect on multiple pathways um, in addition to just bringing the glucose into the cells um, originally. Okay, okay, so for the sort of second half, actually I'll give you, let me give you like two minutes to talk because I know some of you seem to want to share something with some friends. So I'm gonna give you two minutes to talk while well, I have a, a little bit of water here. Okay, let's get started again. Um, now, for this part, we're going to talk about glycogen. Okay, we kind of mentioned a little bit before, but glycogen is basically chains or trees of glucose, and um, we have a bunch in our liver, and that's a source of glucose. It's a, a, a way of storing glucose for many of our tissues. We also have some in our muscles so that it's nice and close and ready to go when we need to run for the bus or run from the tiger or all that sort of stuff, okay? So um, we have some in our muscles. By use by the muscles, we have glycogen in our liver um, that can send, uh, uh, send glucose out into the blood for many tissues, like our brains and everything are always needing more glucose. Okay, so glycogen is basically glucose, Connected glucose, connected more glucose, and more glucose and glucose. So there's a whole bunch of these chains, and it looks like this. Okay, you have this linkage, and basically you just go on. See, there's an N here. Go on farther and farther and farther. If you need some glucose, you want to send some of the glucose through glycolysis, for example. You just chop one off the end. Okay. And this enzyme is glycogen phosphorylase, okay? It's not glycogen hydrolase, it's glycogen phosphorylase, okay? We're gonna chop off a glucose, so you have glucose down here, 
And this is not water. This is our friend inorganic phosphate and glycogen phosphorylase chops and adds. Okay, so you're basically attacking the, the inorganic phosphate and picking it up. And you have a glucose 1-phosphate. Then you have more of the chain. And this end now looks like what you started with, right? It's just one glucose shorter. And so this glycogen phosphorylase can just chop off another one. Okay, so it can chop chop, 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 down the chain. So you can free up a bunch of glucoses pretty quickly. And you actually have many, many, many ends like this that the phosphorylase can work on because your glycogen is actually linked together like a, kind of like a tree. You have a alpha 1,6 linkage here so it's a branch. So here's like a chain, and here is a, one little linkage, and then another branch. And now you have different ends. You have more ends that phosphorylase could work on. So the phosphorylase can chop, 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 make glucose 1-phosphate. The only problem is when you get near that branch, OK? Phosphorylase can't really go any further. But now you have something called a debranching enzyme. It's going to take part of that branch. Oh, move it to the end over here. OK, well, now you can chop, chop, chop down there again. Uh, but you saw this one glucose kind of stuck there. Um, the debranching enzyme will take care of that again. OK? So this enzyme has two different functions. When we pick up something, like these three glucose here, and stick it at the end over here, pick up and move, we call that a transferase activity. It's a transferase, OK? When we're just chopping off, cutting off one glucose, we call that a glucosidase, OK? Chopping, OK? Chopping off one glucose, OK? So now, now we've got a, a section, anyway, of our gl glycogen that, again, we can just now Phosphorylase can come in again. Remove one, remove one, remove one. OK? Now we've got our glucose 1-phosphate. Well, think back on glycolysis. We need a glucose 6-phosphate, not a glucose 1-phosphate. But let's think about this. We know kind of a general type of enzyme that might do something like that. Take a phosphoryl group from a one carbon and get it over there under the six carbon so that we get our glucose six phosphate, which can go through glycolysis, right? Well, we have a mutase. We've heard of a mutase, another mutase in glycolysis. So this is the same sort of idea. In fact, a very similar sort of reaction. We have an enzyme. In this case, this has a serine inactive with a phosphoryl group, uh, passes it over to glucose 1-phosphate to give you glucose 1,6-bisphosphate, uh, and then it picks up, basically, the phosphoryl group um, that was in the 1 position. So you get your enzyme back, ready to go again, phosphoglucomutose, and you get your product glucose 6-phosphate. Okay, so similar to what we saw before in another enzyme, Again, we're using a phosphorylated enzyme, have a phosphoryl group in the active site. In this case, it's a serine before we saw a histidine. Okay, so again, different enzymes might have very similar mechanisms, but a little bit different, uh, different, uh, different uh, amino acid used. Okay, so then, yay, we can send our glucose 6-phosphate through glycolysis. And this was also, this is also sketched in that big chart we had of some of the feeder pathways. This is the phosphoglucomutase that's mentioned in that chart. This is the glucose 1-phosphate that was mentioned in that chart coming from uh, uh, glycogen. Okay. Now, if the glycogen's in the muscles, we chop off our, our, our glucose, and we want to use it right there. Okay, so it's ready to go. We might have many, many, many of those different little branches. 
that the phosphorylase can get lots and lots of glucose out into the cytosol of the cell, and we can burn it up and get lots of ATP. Now, the liver has glycogen as a way of storing an energy uh, molecule, uh, but we want to send it out through the bloodstream to other tissues. So over here we have our, our cytosol. This is inside a liver cell in the yellow here. Um, so we'll have our glycogen, um, and uh, uh, we can make, get our glucose 1-phosphate, make our glucose 6-phosphate, and if we have a, enough that the, the liver, liver cell can um, give some up to the bloodstream, um, we actually need to like send it out. We send it into the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, remove a phosphor group, because when something's phosphorylated and has those negative charges, it's kind of hard to get across a membrane. So first we just have that, we have an actual transporter to help it come through the membrane. We have a phosphatase to remove the phosphor group, and then we have another transporter that kind of gives it a boost to send it out into the bloodstream. Okay, so the glucose from the glycogen and liver, um, you need to get rid of a phosphor group so they can actually transport and send it out into the blood, and so that other cells can take it up because they take up glucose, they don't take up glucose 6-phosphate. Okay. okay, so we can break down glycogen when we need some sugar, when we need some glucose for glycolysis. Um, we also need a way to make it. Okay, so we're going to make some glycogen. This is slightly trickier. Um, we're going to have a sugar with a phosphoryl group. And to help build up something like glycogen, we're going to invest some energy. Okay, so here's an NTP, like ATP, okay, one of the NTPs. And we need to actually activate that sugar. We're going to use not just the, we're not just going to invest a phosphoryl group from um, our NTP, like our ATP. We actually attack here, releasing pyrophosphate, which is two phosphoryl groups hooked together, okay? And then we have a, what we call a sugar nucleotide, NDP sugar. Okay, there's our base, ribose, uh, two phosphoryl groups, and our, our sugar of interest. And we actually then chop our pyrophosphate in two, and we basically are driving this forward to get this molecule for future use, okay? And then, so this molecule, this is an example, this is a UDP glucose, and we have our glycogen synthase, and this is an end of our glycogen chain. So this molecule is actually going to donate the glucose onto the glycogen chain. So even though it sounds like, oh, well, we just you know chop off our glucose to free it up and everything, and great, to actually make our glycogen, we're actually investing uh, um, some energy to really uh, be able to store our glucose like that. So here's our glycogen synthase and here's our glycogen. Now I said that it's not all one long chain. We have these different branches. So we're actually going to be picking up things again. Okay, pick, off a, pick up a piece and move it and make a branch. Okay, so we have a glycogen branching enzyme. We're going to make the branches, and we'll have a whole bunch of these different branches. Um, and uh, we actually start out at the very, very middle. We have a little protein called glycogenin, glycogenin, because we need to actually get this kind of going, this whole branching and everything. Um, and what it does is it makes a little short chain of glycogen, maybe about eight residues, covalently attached, and then all these different enzymes can start building and building and building, branching and branching and branching. And when you get this, so this is just a cartoon of this is like one branch, another branch, the branch, branch, okay. Then you have many, many, many ends that phosphorylase can work on 
So you have lots and lots and lots of um, glucoses can be freed up quickly in the muscle or quickly in the liver. Um, another reason for doing all this is you would actually have sort of a challenge to have just all these free sugar molecules, all these free glucose molecules floating around in a cell have, uh, that would kind of mess up the whole osmolarity and everything. But when you hook them together in this way, all kind of hooked together, it's a good way of storing them compactly and without having to have like lots and lots and lots of water around. Okay, so, um, and, and then again, at that same time, you can free up the glucose rather quickly and uh, uh, send it off um, to glycolysis for breakdown. Okay, so, um, that's what I'm going to say about the glycolysis. I'm going to mention a little bit um, about the next part, which is um, um, citric acid cycle. The, for the last section, it comes kind of close to the exam, the citric acid cycle. So I wanted to just point out a few things in these um, last few minutes here. Um, so we are going to talk about the citric acid cycle. We'll, we'll need to know the pathway in some detail for the exam. And I know some people always ask, um, you know, can they uh, see it a little earlier because now you have, if you want, you can study over spring break or you might have other plans, but <laughs> some people like to have that extra week to really start looking at this, uh, be, you know, so they're not seeing it the week before the exam. So we will be talking about the citric acid cycle. Of course, I'll go through it in some more detail here um, during class. We will be talking about this enzyme. It looks super complicated, but if you kind of look at the different parts, follow the one, two, three, four, five. It'll, it'll make some more sense. You can always read what it says in the book. And then we have the citric acid cycle. This is basically the citric acid cycle. There are eight steps. There are, um, so there are eight enzymes. Um, some of these molecules you may have seen before, maybe not. But um, you, if, when you're studying the glycolysis pathway, um, you can also look at the, um, the citric acid cycle if you want to kind of get, get a, a little bit ahead on, on um, um, learning some of the uh, steps and um, um, molecules. Um, but we'll plan on going through this and the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and all that. Um, what is it, the Tuesday when we come back from spring break. But um, we, we, we will um, be going over this pathway in some detail, so you might want to um, look that over ahead of time. Okay. So, um, so there's a question of, of um, mechanisms. So I expect you to um, uh, know all these different steps. Um, for the actual enzyme mechanisms, you can, you can kind of take the lectures and the um, the PowerPoints is a study guide to see which enzyme mechanisms we um, are actually going through. But in terms of the pathways, we do go through all the steps in some detail. And these are really central pathways and important enzymes. So it is something to really get to know in, in a biochemistry class like this. OK? So, um, so everyone have a great spring break. And see you, I guess, a week from Tuesday, right? OK. Take care.